Good evening, Woodstock Church of Christ. It is good to be with you this evening. Wish I could be there in person, but I think we all understand with the situation being what it is. Uh, sometimes we just do the best we can. Uh, but I am thankful that the summer series was able to continue. I have thoroughly enjoyed <clears throat> my study of this particular uh, subject, this my particular assignment, these two uh, different categories of works of the flesh. And uh, I'm, I'm enjoying looking at some of the other guys too because I've never preached through this. And as a preacher here at Bremen, our local congregation, I want to preach through the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit sometime soon. And so I've really thoroughly enjoyed these lessons. Uh, just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Chad Dollahy, of course. I'm from the Bremen Church of Christ in Bremen, Georgia. Uh, we're over here just, uh, I don't know, 40, 45 miles or so, <clears throat> maybe a little more than that, uh, west, due west of Atlanta, close to the Alabama line. I grew up just over the Alabama line in Heflin, Alabama. Most people have never heard of Heflin, but uh, as close as Woodstock, maybe you have. Uh, but it's good to be with you tonight. Uh, actually, I have been at Bremen. Today marks eight years that I've been at Bremen, and I'm thankful to uh, work with these good brethren. They they put up with me, and they treat me so well and take care of my family, and so I love being here, and I love being in this area. Uh, Woodstock and I, we have something in common. Uh, we put up with Leroy Dedman. Uh, <laughs> I say that jokingly, of course. Leroy Dedman is a dear friend of mine. Uh, he worked here at Bremen for some time. He worked with the Woodstock Church of Christ for a time. And then Leroy and I worked together at the Gospel Broadcasting Network. And I just think the world of Leroy and um, just uh, glad to have that in common with him. And I just can't say enough good about him. Uh, I also think the world of Matt Amos, your preacher. And also, uh, we have another thing in common because there's a Bremen girl and a Woodstock young man who are about to get hitched. And uh, that's happening just the end of this month, the very last day of this month, if I recall correctly. And so we're excited for... Uh, Katie Flanagan and Reagan Amos. But we didn't come talk about all that. I want to get into my lesson. Uh, I was listening to last week's lesson from Brother Benson from Oxford. And of course, he's not very far from us. It's actually about the same distance to go to the Oxford congregation as it is to go to the Woodstock congregation from here. But uh, Brother Benson, that, that is my home congregation. And so uh, I have a lot of ties with them as well. But he was, he, he did an excellent, um, I was trying to think of the, the term he used, um, fly fly over or uh, kind of an overview. He used a, a, an aviation term, as I recall, and now it just slips my mind. But anyway, he, he does a really good overview introducing the book. I'm not going to do that in this particular lesson because I've got to get through my material. So uh, I appreciate him doing that. I would refer you back to that if you want some good introductory and overview material because, man, it was excellent. So uh, what I want to do is come to Galatians 5, 19 and 20 and... You, you know, you've probably have read the verses with, with all of the speakers, but now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We're going to read these again because just to get the overview of this particular context. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, I do remember Brother Mike pointed this out in his lesson as well. Sometimes people say that once a person is saved, they could never fall from grace and that a Christian can never fall away. Uh, you know, I often tell people that you won't fall away against your own will. No one can pluck us from his hand, as Jesus said in John 10. No one can, can take us away from him. <clears throat> but if you choose to turn around and walk away, he won't stop you. He will give you that freedom of choice. Um, sometimes when this discussion comes up, though, people say, oh, okay, you say somebody can so sin as to be lost as a Christian. So why don't you give me the sin? What sin is it? What exact sin? One guy, he, he had this, uh, he, he wrote this paper, and it was called something like, uh, questions no Church of Christ preacher can answer. Well, I always tell the people here at Bremen, I ain't no Church of Christ preacher. <laughs> I'm a gospel preacher. Uh, that that I'm a Christian. I'm not a Church of Christ Christian. I'm a Christian, and I'm not a Church of Christ preacher. I'm just a preacher of the gospel. But that was, that was the title of his little paper or questions, uh, and one of them was, you know, I want to know the exact sin. Uh, you know, it could be any sin if you just choose to do so. It could be something that we call little, but you decide, I don't care what God says about that. 
I'm going to do whatever I want. And you may be still going to worship. You may still be doing other things that God would have you to do. But you decide in that one area, I don't care what God says. Because this is what I want to do. And I'm going to do it. you got a problem if that's what your mindset is. But I will say this. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, you have here a, a definitive list, at least, of some things. This is not exhaustive. In fact, he even tags on at the end and such like, right? But here are some things that he says, these will keep you out of heaven. And folks, he's not writing to non-Christians. He's writing to Christians. So that's important to remember. These are what we might call non-starters with God. They're non-negotiable as far as you cannot make these your practice. Now, it's, sometimes people will, they'll make a mistake. They'll stumble, they'll fall, and they'll sin. <clears throat> it, it happens sometimes, and, and sadly, it even happens to Christians. It's a fact. I make mistakes. You make mistakes. We all do. But if this becomes your practice, he says it's going to keep you out of heaven. So I, I hope that serves as just, you know, again, a brief introduction to what we're talking about tonight just to drive home the seriousness of what we're talking about. We sometimes read through a list like this, and there are all these words, and I read from the King James, and I know we're going to reference the New King James a lot. I, I tell people I like the King James just because I grew up with it, and I did all my memorization from it when I was a kid, when I was in preaching school, and now I'm just too lazy to memorize from any other translation. So uh, I still sometimes will go with it, and a lot of the quotations will be from the King James, but we'll, we'll explain our terms, and sometimes some of these words are not the words that we would use necessarily as so I like the New King James or ESV or some some version that updates the language a little bit but these are words that even even in the New King James or some other versions sometimes we read through these and we just you know kind of gloss over it but these are serious folks and that's what I want to drive home to us uh, I'm going to switch over to a different view here so that you can see uh, my PowerPoint. I did a little bit of a PowerPoint. There's not a whole lot in this, but I, I we, we got a lot to cover, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ground to cover, and there's there are a lot of verses, and I didn't want to lose folks with some of uh, a number of the verses and the points. So I want to I, I hope this will help you to stay with me a little bit. We're talking first of all about jealousies. Our, our topic tonight obviously is is jealousies and outbursts of wrath. That's that's the way the New King James has it, and I want to say maybe the ASV or uh, ESV as well. Emulations is what the King James has for this first one. Now, on both of these, what we're going to do is we're going to define the, the word in the Greek, and we're going to look at it, see how it's used in the New Testament, and then we want to look at some uses of it where it's used in a good context. We want to look at some uses of it where it's used in a bad context, and then we'll you know kind of have, if you want to call it application, I've got on my outline here, I've just got takeaway. Uh, what do we take away from this? I, I like to use that term sometimes, like when I'm walking away from a passage, I've been studying this, reading it, imbibing it, but when I walk away, what do I need to take from this study? And, and I want to do that on each one of these. These are uh, these are related in a, in a sense, but, but they also are kind of individual, so I almost feel like I'm preaching uh, two sermons, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll divide it up that way. So I've got this kind of title slide that we're looking at here. And then what I'll do is same thing. We come to outbursts of wrath. So let's dive right in and talk about this work of the flesh called in the new King James jealousies or emulations and the King James. I said these terms are related and, and you're going to see that they are because they're, they're related in the same or, or similar in the sense that they both have good usage. They they both can be used even of God. But then they both have a bad sense as well. So you're going to see that as we go. Now, let's talk about zelos. Uh, this is the word translated jealousies, or again, if you're looking at the King James, emulations. It's used 17 times in 17 verses in the New Testament. You're going to find that 17 times in 17 verses. Uh, Here's how it breaks down in the translation. Emulations, you see that right here in Galatians 5. Emulations, one time, is translated fervent mind once, jealousy once, indignation twice. 
is translated as envy once. It's translated as envying five times. And here's the most common translation of this word, zelos or, or zelos. Uh, Y'all bear with me because I, I was, uh, when I went to the Memphis School of Preaching, I had a Greek teacher and he was, he was adamant that uh, the Omicron, what we would call the O in Greek, is pronounced with a short O sound, ah. I took a couple of Greek classes at Amridge to finish up my bachelor's degree, and they, uh, the instructor there, who is a PhD, and he's, he's got that over my Greek instructor at Memphis, so I took his word for it, uh, but he's a PhD in languages, and I think in the Greek language, in Koine Greek, but he, he pronounced it with a long O, and he would he said that we know that because of um, archaeological evidence and how sometimes people will misspell something. And if you've ever had children, you know children when they're first learning to write, they spell everything phonetically, and it's hilarious. Um, I, I still have some notes from my children when they were spelling that way. All that's just to say, there are times when I'm going to say zelos, and there are times when I'm going to say zelos. It's the same word. It's just uh, Brother Mosier just beat it into our brains to pronounce Omicron with a ah uh, instead of an o oh sound <laughs> so uh, i apologize if i go back and forth but i'm gonna try to stick with what dr smill said in, in our greek classes so those are your those are how the translations break down for zelos uh, emulations fervent mind jealousy indignation envy or envying but the number one usage six times in the new testament it's translated the word is zelos right can you guess zeal that's how it's translated the most uh here's a definition from strong's uh concordance it's heat figuratively zeal in a favorable sense ardor ardor um I, i'm, I'm kind of over pronouncing that because it's not a word we use often ardor in an unfavorable one jealousy as of a husband or an enemy so, you know, it's, it's a pretty flexible word. It can mean you're really zealous about something. You're fired up about something. Or you're jealous in a not so good sense. But, you know, jealousy could even have good usages, right? And, and that's where I want to get to. Uh, I want to go back to my PowerPoint here because what you're going to notice is um, this, this word, it has good usage, usages and it has bad usages. Here is zelos used in a good way. John 2, 17. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So there's the word being used in a good way. Uh, Paul says in Romans 10, 2, talking about his Jewish brethren according to the flesh, he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They don't have a zeal according to knowledge. Paul talks about himself before he became a Christian. And he says concerning zeal, persecuting the church. There in Philippians 3, 6. It's used in a good way in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 2, talking about the contribution. Paul says to the Corinthian church, he says, your zeal has provoked many, very many. You've, you've helped stir up many others to participate in this contribution because of your zeal. That was a good thing. That was uh, absolutely a good thing. Uh, then in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, let me switch to the PowerPoint as full screen. He says, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He, he says, Paul does, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Now, that's that word zelos in the Greek. So the word can be used in a good way, but you know where we're going with this because the word can also be used in a bad way. And that's what we're going to see here. Here's Zelos used in a bad way. The high priest rose up, Acts 5, 17, and all those that were with him, whoops, i got to get back over here to my PowerPoint. The high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is a sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. There's your word, indignation. And I told you it was only what, uh, twice that it's translated indignation in the New Testament. Here's one of them. Uh, they were filled with zeal. But this is not a good zeal because they're working against the message of the gospel. Uh, another example here, Acts 13, 5, 45. When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. 
Acts 13, 45. Uh, envy. There's your word, Zalos. This is one of the things I, I really get aggravated, frustrated about with the King James sometimes. I love the King James. I grew up with it, as I said. I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I jokingly say, but it, I guess it's kind of true. Uh, I'm too lazy to memorize out of a different translation. Uh, sometimes I, I like I like the the style, the flow of it uh, in that old King James, uh, that, that older language. But this is one of the things that frustrates me about it because sometimes they will take the same word in Greek and translate it completely different ways. Now, sometimes that makes sense because a lot of Greek words, Koine Greek words, many of them were super flexible and they could be, depending on the context used, translated different ways. It's like the word cool. You know, we sometimes say, hey, could you turn on some heat? It, it's cool in here. Uh, we sometimes say, man, that car is so cool. Uh, you know, bad. And I can say, don't do that. That's bad. But then somebody else could drive up in a nice car and say, man, that is so bad. You know, we just use words in a different way. Uh, all languages do that. But envy, you know, translating this into English, envy and jealousy are not the same thing. And, and you're going to see this when you get to, I think envy is, is further down. I was looking to, uh, yeah, it's in verse 21. You'll see this when you get to uh, the brother who's going to handle that. It, they're not the same thing. They're very related. But envy takes it to the next level, we might say. You're willing to hurt somebody to obtain what they've got. Or you're willing to take it from them or something like that. So they're not exactly the same. And I don't, I don't really understand why coming to Zalos here, they would translate that envy. They were filled with jealousy, zeal, you could say, and a bad, bad kind of zeal. But it's not necessarily, uh, it's not, not the same, at least those two English words, envy and, and jealousy. But be that as it may, that's what they did. So let's, uh, let's go on and see some more usages here in a bad way. Zalos used in a bad way. I will switch back to full screen here. Let us walk honestly, Paul says, as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, Romans 13, 13. Well, again, unfortunately, this word is translated envying. Uh, I think that captures the idea, but that's just not, uh, I mean, it could, it could work. It just, uh, it, it just doesn't seem to me it's the most accurate translation of the actual uh, word and, no, and those words in English are different, but anyway, used in a different in a bad sense, obviously. There, let's notice one more here. If I can get right, I'm having to when I click to change my camera view, I have to go back to my PowerPoint to have control over it with my remote control here. First Corinthians 3 3, Paul says, For you are yet carnal, whereas for whereas there is strife, there is among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men? 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. So again, it's translated envying there. Um, envying and strife, they always seem to run together. You see this here in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. You see it right here. And uh, uh, I'm looking at the long place. Here we go. Uh, Romans 13, 13. Strife and envying. Envying and strife. Uh, in James, James 3, 14, James says, but if you have bitter envying and strife, in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. James 3, 16, just two verses later, he says, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Uh, those fellas, they run together, envying and strife. You, you take a place where there's envy, and, and even if you want to go with, uh, and it certainly wouldn't be a bad idea to go with jealousy here, is better, I, again, and let me say I'm no Greek expert, so uh, somebody may say, no, Chad, you're, you're wrong about that. I might be, uh, but as far as I can tell, let me say that. Uh, it seems like it's not exactly accurate. But uh, envying, jealousy, and, and in some of those cases, it, it it would certainly fit the category of envying. They're, they're to the point of ready to hurt somebody. Um, they're, they're jealous to the point of taking it to the next level, so to speak, whether stealing, hurting somebody to take it or whatever. But uh, bitter envying or envying and strife, they run together. You find where there's a place where people are jealous, they're envious, you're going to have strife every time. Mark it down. It will happen. Zalos, uh, it derives from uh, a Greek word, zeo. And, and I, I, again, I'm not a Greek expert. I'm not great at pronouncing that, but it's kind of a, we would spell it with like a DZ. So it's like zelos, zeo, almost a D sound at the beginning of it. But the word means to be hot, to boil of liquids, or glow of solids. 
figuratively, to be fervid or to be fervent. So it's like water sitting on the stove, and what happens? You heat it up, you heat it up, you heat it up, and it begins to boil. That's zeal. That's zelos. Uh, more accurately, zeo, which is the root word for zelos. You, you take a, a piece of metal, and it gets so hot that it's glowing hot. So all that being said, I, I want to ask a question here. You think about this. What... What are you zealous about? What gets you fired up? That's what I want to think about. What gets you fired up? Is it is it Alabama football? I like Alabama football. Some people may not. That's okay. I mean, nobody's perfect. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I enjoy that. Some people like Auburn. Some people like Georgia. Uh, maybe it's Falcons. NFL football. I have a brother-in-law. He, he hates college football. All he cares about is NFL. What gets you fired up? Is it blues hockey? I'm a huge St. Louis blues fan. I love uh, I love hockey, period. But I especially love the St. Louis blues. And we were excited last year because our team finally won a Stanley Cup. First ever in franchise history. What gets you fired up? You get fired up about football, hockey, basketball, Braves baseball? I found some pictures here. These people, NFL fans. It was like a website, most outrageous NFL fans or something. I think they definitely qualify. But these people are fired up. But about what, you know? I mean, what do we get fired up about? Some people get more excited, more fired up about mundane things of the world than they do the Lord. And it's sad. It's, it's pitiable. Do you get fired up about evangelism? Do you get fired up about studying the Bible? I'm not saying go, you know, going to church and it's a it's a big party and we're shouting and stuff. We understand that. God says things need to be done decently and in order. But I mean, are you zealous? And even, you know, with sports, not everybody goes and, you know, dresses like this outrageously or something. But what do I get fired up about? Am I more zealous over worldly things than I am for things of the Lord? That's That's the question that I'm getting at. Are you more zealous over things that are worldly or are you more zealous over things that are spiritual? That's that's what I'm getting at. Hey, it's great to be fired up. And, and I like to see, you know, the one, one thing we were, uh, last year we were watching the Stanley Cup final and it was uh, the Blues and, and the Boston Bruins. And as I said, we the Blues, uh, my, mine, my children's favorite team won the Stanley Cup. We were so excited, but... One of the games, it may have even been game seven, that they showed a, a person in the stands, they're sitting right on the glass. No, no, it was not. It was game seven of the Dallas series. It was second round of the playoffs, and it was game seven, double overtime, okay? Double OT, it doesn't get any more exciting than that in playoff hockey, right? There's a fan sitting like three or four rows back from the glass, may have been right on the glass, I don't remember, but they showed them on TV, and here's this fan, arms folded, just asleep. Double OT, I guess, you know, it's past his bedtime or something. This was not an old person that's like, oh, wow, I'm so past my bedtime. And, and my boys and I, we were like, what are you doing? You're at game seven. It's in double OT. You know, so I'm, I'm not saying we should not be excited, be zealous about stuff. But what gets us most zealous? That's my point. It is great to be fired up, but we need to be fired up over the right things. Let's get zealous for good things. Paul said this in Galatians 4, 17. They zealously affect you. Talking about Judaizers. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. And not only when I am present with you. Now, let's get zealous over good things. And then he says, Who gave himself for us. Paul, again, writing here. Of Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Do we get do we get fired up about doing work for the church? Do we get fired up about doing work for the Lord? You know, I think about I remember being a youth worker, and sometimes we would say uh, we we had up in Illinois, and I actually worked in the St. Louis area, and so you can imagine why I'm such a a crazy nut St. Louis fan. <laughs> but we would have Tuesday Bible Talks, we called it, TBT, for the teenagers. 
we get 10, 15 to show up, you know. And then I get up and announce we're going to go next, you know, two or three weeks from now, we're going to go to Six Flags. Six Flags in St. Louis. And like 40 kids show up, right? Well, something's wrong there. Why are people so zealous to go out and do something like that, but you can't get anybody zealous for good works? Uh, something is missing there when that's the case. And then, you know, we also need to be zealous to repent. Jesus says in Revelation 3.19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And he says, Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He's talking to the church there at Laodicea, and he says, I love you, and I want you to do what's right. Be zealous and repent. Get Make this right. Don't just sit there and do nothing. Get right. We need to make sure our zeal also is for God's glory. I need to make sure it's for His glory, not mine. Sometimes we get zealous for some kind of selfish glory. Uh, and sometimes people work and they get so upset because nobody's recognized them. And look, we all, and that, some of that's different personalities and different love languages. And some people, uh, you know, I, I'm a person that I, I appreciate words of encouragement. And it's very encouraging to me. But I have to constantly remind myself that just because somebody's not going, good job, Chad. Thank you for doing that. I want to recognize you. It doesn't, doesn't matter because I'm not doing it for recognition. I'm not doing it for that. I'm doing it for the Lord. At least I should be. And that's what we have to remind ourselves sometimes. Do it for the good of the church. I heard of a fellow one time, two preachers sitting down, and the one preacher was so upset. He was so discouraged, and he says, I, I can't believe. He says, this, this church he was working at, he'd been there for a long time. And he said, they just let me go. They just let me go. And he said, I... I'm just, I'm so upset, I'm so discouraged, and I just can't believe they do that after all I did, after all I did for them. And his friend, who was a true friend, said, you know, it's a shame you didn't do all that just for the Lord. Got his attention, didn't it? I would hope so. Putting off the old man, we're going to talk more about that in just a moment. Putting off the old man when I become a Christian means putting off selfishness. Now listen, that's a process, right? You know it as well as I do. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm 21 years old and I'm still learning that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm 42. I'll be 43 at the end of this summer. But, you know, it's an ongoing process. We understand that. Putting off selfishness, putting off a self-first mindset is part of putting on the old man. Let me tell you a great deterrent to jealousies. And that is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. Paul says, Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You develop the mind of Christ and you'll have a great deterrent to the jealousies that Paul writes about. And this obviously being used in a negative way here in the works of the flesh. It's great to be zealous. great to be fired up. Let's just make sure we're zealous over the right things. So that's our word, zealous, jealousies or emulations, as the King James puts it. Let's shift gears now and let's talk about, I don't know if I can get my PowerPoint right. Let's shift gears and talk about, <laughs> I keep going to the wrong screen, sorry. It gets confusing. I haven't had to live stream in a little while. We've been having our summer series here. We've been able to have it in person. Uh, we've got several ways that we can uh, kind of help clean the building and sanitize the building and stuff. So we've been able to have ours in person. And uh, so I'm not, I've, I got used to this during the quarantine, but it's a little bit, I'm having to get used to it again here. All right, so let's talk about our next Greek word. If I can get my clicker right. There we go. This is wrath in the King James. The New King James has outbursts of wrath. Um, this is a very interesting word. It's used some 18 times in 18 verses. 18 times, 18 verses. That's King James, obviously. Uh, at, at least, well, it's, that's in the Greek. It's a Greek word. Uh, but my point being here in the King James, I, when I give you, and I, I didn't mention this with uh, Zalos, but when I give you how many times it's used, I mean, not how many times it's used, uh, how it is translated 
how many times it's translated this way or that way. That's coming from the King James. That's what I'm trying to say. That was a really long roundabout way to tell you that. Uh, thumos is the Greek word here. I thought I put the word on my title screen, but I guess I did not. It'll be on the next slide. Thumos. Or, again, some people say thumos. But here, let me tell you how it's translated. 18 times in 18 verses. Uh, it's translated as indignation once. So you see it is a little similar to Zalos. Uh, thumos, indignation, one time, fierceness, two times, wrath, 15 times. So far more often than not, it's translated wrath. Uh, here, here's an interesting thing. Well, let me give you the definition first from Strong's. Uh, it's it's def defined as passion, as if breathing hard, like just, you know, sometimes you ever do that? You ever just get so mad and you, I know sometimes I do, and I see other people do it as well. That's kind of the, you know, this burst of breath, breathing hard, fierceness, indignation, wrath. Now, all those are definitions of the term. Here, here's what I was going to tell you that's interesting. Its opposite is macrothumos, macrothumos, which means patiently, or macrothumia, which means long suffering. Macro meaning long or extended and thumos meaning wrath. So extended wrath, long suffering. It takes a long time to get that person upset. What a difference. You see why I say it's the opposite of thumos. This, this word thumos, it, it may be used to refer to God's wrath. Uh, I'm going to read you several verses. I'm going to read these quickly because, um, there, there are a lot of them, and I just want to read them just to point this out. But this word used for God's wrath several times in the book of Revelation. We just completed a book, of, a study of the book of Revelation for our summer series. And uh, I felt like I, I got to be almost an expert in live streaming because I had to do so much. And there was just nobody here to help, you know, because it was uh, during the quarantine. But uh, well, I, was, I was really glad we were able to finish that study, even though we did the shelter in place and all that, because I, it was a, just an excellent study. I, I loved it. I learned so much from that. Um, I don't know if the class learned anything, but I know I did. <laughs> of course, the teacher always learns the most, right? Revelation 14, oh, sorry. Revelation 14, 8, 10, and 19. I'll read those quickly. There, there follows another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Um, I just realized... I, I grabbed the wrong verse there. I apologize. That's talking about uh, the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's talking about Babylon, which in, in context would seem to be wrong there in the book of Revelation. Uh, but yeah, just scratch that one off if you wrote that down. I, I, I don't know how I did that. But anyway, it's just a mistake. Uh, Revelation 14.10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. There's the reference to the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone uh, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Let me switch back over here. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to take that out so that it's in the it's not in the video just sitting there while I'm reading the others and somebody read that and think, that's not right. So I can do that easily enough. And then we'll go back to the desktop capture. All right. Revelation 14, 19, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great, great winepress of the wrath of God. All right, so there's another usage, uh, again, re referring to God's wrath. Revelation 15, 1, uh, I, saw another angel, uh, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. 15, verse 7, one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, or bowls, full of the wrath of of God who liveth forever and ever. 16.1. Heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out your vials or bowls of wrath, of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 18.3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. <laughs> I did it again. That's a reference to Babylon. Um, I apologize. I thought I... Checked those because I remember seeing those 
and uh, saying, I got to get those out because it, it's the same word. It's right there in the same context of all the stuff in Revelation. And so it's easy to, uh, it's easy to do that and accidentally uh, throw that in. And I thought I had got that out. So anyway, wrath, thumos is often used for God's wrath in the book of Revelation. You see this uh, several, several times. I do want to show you something interesting. I don't think I have these printed on the screen, but I'll read them from my list here. Uh, thumos and orge are used together in Revelation 16, 19, and 19, 15. And I just realized I forgot to tell you about orge. I had that in my notes, and I just skipped right over it, and I didn't, didn't realize it. Uh, thumos is distinguished from another Greek word that probably more, most often is translated anger. Uh, that word, obviously, as you see here now, is orge. Orge. It, it's it's often translated. Most, I think, I, I, I meant to, I don't think I wrote it down. I, I did check it. I, I'm, I'm going based on memory, but I'm pretty sure it's most often translated anger. Like thumos is most often translated wrath. But Sometimes people say, well, what's the difference in them? Wrath, anger, isn't that just, are those just synonymous terms? Here's the difference in the Greek, as, as what I can tell studying it. Most of the time, and, and sometimes these words are flexible depending on context. The biggest difference is when you think of thumos, uh, let me say this. When you think of orge, you think of a, like an oil, oil fire. Or kerosene, maybe, would be a good example. But oil, probably even better. It burns long, and it burns hot. When you think of thumos, think of a gasoline fire. You know what happens if you have a gasoline fire, right? When I was a kid, I decided one time, I'd seen my dad do it. He, he would go, we'd have these huge ant beds. We lived out in the country. And these ant beds would just get like two feet high, and just incredible. I mean, they would like bog down the lawnmower when you'd run over them. And it just it drove them crazy. And so my dad, I saw him one time, he went out and got gasoline poured all around there, you know, and, and he lit the thing. That was the coolest thing ever, you know, for a little boy. And so one day, man, my dad was gone somewhere and I think mom was home, but uh, I ran across a big old ant bed in the yard. And you know what I did? I went and got the gasoline just like daddy. And I poured it all over there, and I didn't think, didn't know to wait and let the fumes, you know, kind of, so, as soon as I struck the match, I lost eyebrows, about, you know, hair back to here, <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget it. That's Thumos. It's a, just a big explosion. Orge, orge is this, uh, like, lasting it's more lasting in nature you can have either one with god but you see both in revelation 16 19 and 19 15 god when he explodes in anger it's never just because he lost control it's because the order gay has has built up to a point and now it's it there's there's got to be an outlet uh, you see this with the captivity of israel that was kind of you know almost like the the explosion it's been building for a long time and now it goes from Orge to Thumos. Something's got to give. Um, Revelation 16, 19. Let me read you this verse. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Uh, the Orge of his Thumos. This is the outburst. Uh, I may have that backwards. Let me check. Um, sometimes you just forget stuff, and I always tell the members here I need to write it down because if I don't, I will forget. But I think that's right. Uh, it's it's kind of the outlet. Uh, yeah, I I, I did have them backwards. I, I thought that was right. Um, when it says the fierceness of his wrath, fierceness there is thumos. It's actually translated fierceness in this context. Wrath there is the orge. So this is the outlet. Now it's built up that, that lasting anger. God has been tolerant. And now there comes a judgment. Revelation 19, 15. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and 
he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Again, those two words used together. Romans 2 8, it's not di directly tied with God, but I believe in the context there it is referring to God. Uh, it says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. Uh, they, in other words, these people who are contentious, they don't obey the truth, they obey unrighteousness. To them, they're going to receive indignation and wrath. The indignation there is... Again, I'm wondering, I didn't, I didn't underline it. Usually I underline those. The indignation, I believe, is the thumos. Romans 2, 8. I can pull it up here on my Bible software and see that easily enough. Uh, in fact, let me just move it over here and I'll let you search with me. Romans 2, verse 8. Yes, indignation, thumos, and wrath. Or again. So, that's the words being used together. And all that's not, you know, it's not like it's critical to our understanding of this concept, but it's just, it's interesting to see how things are used. Uh, let's see Thumos used for man's wrath. You see this in, uh, let me get my clicker here. You see this in Luke 4, 28 and 29 in response to Jesus' message. Uh, they, they were filled with wrath at his message, and they want to, they want to kill Jesus after that. You see it in Acts 19, 27, and 28, the reaction to Paul's message was wrath. You see it in 2 Corinthians 12, 20, Paul fears when he comes to Corinth, he's going to find outbursts of wrath. This is that thumos. Uh, all these words are where thumos is used. And uh, Moses in Hebrews 11, 27, it says he didn't fear the wrath of the king, talking about Pharaoh. Uh, there's a reference to the devil's wrath in Revelation 12, verse 12. Let me get off the screen here so you can see that. Woe to the inhabitants or the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Well, the devil knows his time is short, and so he's, he's coming down to, cast down to the earth with great wrath. All right, let's talk about putting off the old man. When you talk about thumos and this outburst of wrath, you got to talk about this. Um, when I become a Christian, I must put that off. Uh, you have to put off the old man when you become a Christian. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, as the King James has, evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. Uh, you've got to got to put that away. You're not the same person. That's one of the themes of Christianity. Don't live like you used to. Don't act like you used to. Don't explode with anger like you used to. And getting back to our first point, don't be zealous over worldly things like you used to. Now you're zealous over things that are of God. It's not to say you can't be zealous about things that are mundane and not wrong, like sports, but, but you're more zealous for the things that really matter, spiritual things. Colossians 3.8 is the parallel verse for Ephesians 4.31, but now you also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. And so understand the consequences here are eternal. Those that do such things, they cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. You can't go to heaven doing these things. You can't go to heaven practicing these things and making that your habit if you refuse to repent. Not all anger is wrong. Be angry and sin not. Ephesians 4, 26. Jesus looked on them all with anger, Mark 3, verse 5. But here's a fact. Some folks have anger issues. They have explosive anger. They're like a fire-breathing dragon. And, you know, we may call it a violent temper. We may call them rage monster. Uh, they blow like a gasoline fire. Words, actions are just sometimes just out of control. It, it is. It's just like an explosion. Some folks have a problem with that. It may be coaches. It may be athletes. It may be parents. It may be kids going off on their parents. It may be members of the church. It might even be gospel preachers. And sometimes it's even elders in the church. Some folks have an, an explosive anger. Don't try to just excuse it. Sometimes people just try to excuse explosive wrath. They, they'll say things like, well, that's just my personality. Well, put it off. That's what Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 8. We just read a moment ago. Put that off. You've got to get rid of that. Put it away. Then, sometimes people will say, well, I just say what's on my mind, Chad. You know, I just got to say what's on my mind. 
I know I, I blow up sometimes, but I just say what's on my mind. Well, so does a fool. A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Proverbs 12, 16. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Proverbs 29, verse 11. Sometimes people say, I just say what's on my mind, Chad. Well, the Bible says that's a fool. You need to think about that. How do we battle against wrath? If you're struggling with this, what do you do? What, what, what can I do to help myself deal with this problem? You need to recognize it. Hold yourself accountable. You need to understand the words of James 1.26 where he says, uh, you know, if, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, this man's re religion is vain. You've got to bridle your tongue. You know, you got to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, James 1, 19 and 20. You need to surround yourself with people who are going to hold you accountable. People who are, are going to say, hey, whoa, you know, I thought you were working on that, Chad. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, Proverbs 27, verse 6. But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. You need to avoid situations or people that you know are going to bring out the worst. If you know it's going to, you know, put you in a potentially explosive situation, try to stay away. I know sometimes that, that's not an option. But if it is, why, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we avoid that situation or that person who I know is going to bring out the worst? You know, these are some of the tips you get if you read secular sites and stuff, but they're, they help. You can breathe deeply when you get upset. Take a walk. Do some exercise. Sometimes I go for a jog or um, something that's, you know, high cardio because it just the more I sweat, the more stress relief I feel. Get adequate rest. Do you know how many people have an anger problem just because they don't get enough rest? They're blowing up because they're tired. I mean, I, I noticed it. I have noticed it uh, so many times through the years. When I'm super tired, man, I get a short fuse, and I have to watch that. And then finally pray about it. Jesus says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, Matthew 26, 41. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. We need God's help. Ask for God's help. I want to close with some wisdom from Proverbs on this matter. And hopefully this will be encouraging to you and help you as you work to fight against this thumos, outbursts of wrath. So some people may not have as much of a problem with this, just the same as you know some of these other things in the works of the flesh are not a temptation for some, but they're a huge temptation for others. But if you're working on this, keep in mind these verses from Proverbs. Proverbs 14, 29, he that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalteth folly. 1632, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. Do you have rule over your spirit? I hope you do. Proverbs 15, 18, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. And then Proverbs 19, 11, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. 29, 22 says, an angry man stirreth up strife. And a furious man aboundeth in transgression. We need to work against these outbursts of wrath. Again, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to be with you. Again, I'm Chad Dalahide. I, I preach at the Bremen Church of Christ. I'm, I'm proud to be working together with you in this area. I'm proud to be partnered together with you in this summer series. And I hope and I pray that we all will work to be zealous over the things that are good to God's glory, not our own, and that we will always work to be long-suffering and to make sure we, when we do get upset, it's not an explosive loss of control, but we get upset about the right things and in the right way. May God bless us as we seek to follow his will and go to heaven. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. And I am thankful to be with you. I'm thankful that you are here to study God's word. And I look forward to seeing you or being with you again sometime, hopefully, in the near future. Thank you. God bless.